tigers and peacocks and man babies, oh my! From high-end hotels to the back alleys of high-end hotels, some good old-fashioned cartoon comedy is coming at you. Welcome to Channel 8 and a Half. Hello and welcome back to Channel 8 and a Half, a podcast about film, television, and pop culture. My name is Andrew Hanna. I am Joe Galena. This week, it's a throwback to an old set of characters that we know and love. Joe, what are we talking about? Andrew, we're keeping it light this week. Yeah. We've been talking about too much dark stuff recently on this show. It's Oscar season, that's why. It's all about serious things, so we decided this week... We're going to keep it light. We're going to talk about the movie Cherry, about a man who goes to war and then comes back and starts a classic sketch comedy group. No, that's not true. We're talking about Tom and Jerry. Your eyes lit up in fear. You had me terrified. I I wish the viewers could have seen your face as I said that. You were like, what? I thought we agreed on the cartoon. I was like, did I watch the wrong movie? This is the first time this has ever happened. I thought we were going to do some fun stuff about a cat and a mouse. You're talking about... Drugs and whatnot. That was a lot of fun. That must have been fun for you. It was quite. A, it was quite a good time for me. We're talking about Tom and Jerry. That's what we're talking about. Were you a fan of Tom and Jerry growing up? Oh, I love Tom and Jerry. Did you really? Yeah, I used to watch Tom and Jerry all the time. I think also because my mom used to watch Tom and Jerry back in Egypt as well, so she would play it for me, and it was all slapstick, so there wasn't really any talking. Cultural, yeah, no cultural barriers, yeah, no language barriers. Exactly. Plays really well to a wide audience, a lot like Transformers does. Action movies, yeah. easy to easy to translate. Charlie Chaplin. And that was one of her favorites. So it just made sense. Exactly. Whereas I came at this the other way, by the way. I really don't care about the classic Tom and Jerry. I watched really? it. No, I didn't. If I'm going to choose my dynamic duo of one animal beating up another animal in a comedic fashion, I'm choosing Wiley e. Coyote and the Roadrunner. Yeah, That's exactly yeah, right. Period. But Tom and Jerry is the more, I would say, culturally relevant of the two because mm-hmm. it inspired a lot more. There's no itchy and scratchy on The Simpsons without Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry were in many mainstream movies and the animation style blending with live action is not a new thing for Tom and Jerry. There's a very famous uh, scene in in a movie called Anchors Away mm-hmm. with Gene Kelly, where he dances with Jerry. People would know that scene. You wouldn't know the title, but you'd know it from Family Guy. I've actually seen the scene, but I don't think I've ever seen the movie. Uh, probably not. You've seen yeah. that scene because it's one of the first examples of blending live action and animation together. And Family Guy did it where they replaced Jerry with Stewie, and probably a lot of people would recognize that. But I don't really have an emotional connection to Tom and Jerry coming into this. Tom and Jerry was a big part of my childhood. I didn't even know that this existed until you were like, hey, we should talk about Tom and Jerry. I was like, I didn't know that there was a Tom and Jerry movie. And then there was, <laughs> unfortunately. Oh, and, and then you found out it existed. It's definitely real. But before we go any further, we'll tell you a little bit about the premise of Tom and Jerry, which takes place in New York. And Jerry has just arrived in town and he decides to move into a luxury hotel, which happens to be putting on a wedding for a celebrity couple. And then you have Chloe Grace Moretz, who plays Kayla. She's down on her luck and lands a temporary job working at the hotel for the wedding through questionable means when the hotel realizes they have a mouse problem. And then Chloe decides to hire Tom to help her catch Jerry, (laughs) and then slapstick antics ensue. Uh, What did you think about this, Joe? I'm sure everybody who worked on this got paid a lot of money. Good for them. Oh, yeah. Good for them. Tim Story, who directed it. If I'm sure that Warner Brothers came to him and is like, Tim, I know you made Barbershop. (laughs) I know you made the Fantastic Four movie. Do you like Tom and Jerry? And he's like, Warner Brothers, I like the amount of zeros you're going to put at the end of this check. Sign me up. Because this movie is, it's not great. I did laugh a couple of times. The Tom and Jerry parts of this movie, I think, are fun. There's a bit where it's classic Tom and Jerry, slapstick, ridiculous things happening. There's a bit where, you know, Tom is chasing Jerry into a loading dock and the loading dock crashes down on Tom's head. And then the door comes up again and it smashes down on him like four or five times. I was like, that's funny. The problem with this movie is that it focuses far too much on the human characters. I did not care about Kayla and her plight. I didn't care about the wedding, which, by the way, Colin Jost plays <laughs> one half of New York's power couple. You know, classic handsome man, Colin Jost. I can't wait for the jokes to, that are going to come out of this movie being mm. released from Michael Che on Weekend Update. That was the only exciting part about this. His wife to be, Preta, played by Paliva Sharda, who I did not know. I guess she's a British yeah. actress. And I'm assuming they needed a Indian wedding 
in order to justify all of the animals that show up in this wedding. Because if there was <laughs> I didn't just think about that. I, that's what I thought of immediately. I, I was I was thinking about it from like a from a hotel point of view because I worked in hotels for ten years and the yeah, you, Indian yeah. weddings are huge. So that's that's kind of like where I was coming from. I didn't actually think I was like, oh yeah, that's probably the only way you can get as many animals in a building as you could. Well, that's because if it was a white person wedding, it'd just be it'd be like doves. two people standing up there. Yeah, not even doves. It's just. Two people standing up there and like, well, rapping doves. oh my God, this movie starts with wrapping pigeons. Oh, <laughs> that five minutes you. in. That's the thing. They all say the first image of your film should tell you everything that a viewer needs to know about the movie. It, it should really be kind of the introduction to the themes, the, the characters, whatever it might be. And when it starts like that with wrapping pigeons, you're like, oh, OK, you apply that rule, just not in the great way. This is a movie that relies weirdly on a lot of 90s hip hop. Shocking amounts. Yeah, that's true. It's only a 90 minute movie. And I think that 15 minutes was delegated to montages to 90s hip hop song. <laughs> like it's such a bizarre bizarre pacing to this thing. What did you think of this movie? I didn't ask you. I know what you thought, but tell me. It's sad when you go into something expecting it to be terrible and it finds a way to exceed your expectations. So, at least it exceeded my expectation in some way, shape or form, <laughs> but Honestly, the biggest criticism that I have is why Why are you even making this? Why do we need a Tom and Jerry movie? And nostalgia doesn't work a generation later unless you're targeting it at the same audience that used to watch the cartoon. I mean, it, it wouldn't make sense to kids that these days, they don't know who Tom and Jerry is. And you can't even like say, oh, yeah, I, I want to show my kids who Tom and Jerry were or like what I used to watch. It's like, but it's not Tom and Jerry. It's just some weird 3D rendering of Tom and Jerry. How did you feel about the animation? Did you think I it was odd? It. Yeah, I thought it was stupid. I thought it was odd. I, I mean, what is one of the best crossover animation and live action movies that you can think of off the top of your head? Obviously, Monkey Bone, Brendan Fraser's 2001 classic. Thank you very much. Or maybe Who Framed Roger Rad Rabbit, but whatever. <laughs> Who Framed Roger Rabbit was the one I had in mind. But yes, I mean, that was all 2D, but it was still very, very good. And the animation is just unnerving. I, I hate it. And I hate it even more applied to one of my favorite cartoons growing up. I have a theory about the story of this, and I'm glad that you brought up Who Framed Roger Rabbit, too. Because I didn't care at all about the emotional stakes of this movie at all, obviously. I, I didn't expect it to strike any nostalgia in me whatsoever. But even with, with Kayla and her plight, because, you know, she's the main character and she's down on her luck. She gets fired from a job where she's a delivery person and she cons her way, like I said, into a job at this hotel. Very shady hiring practices at this hotel. Like, why would you even show this to your kids? <laughs> because, like, everyone is terrible. Everyone lies, cheats, and steals and gets away with it. White collar crime, that's all right. You can have your wedding at a fancy hotel and get cool drones and skateboards, a la Colin Jost and then steal someone's identity don't worry about it you <laughs> yeah. have a really good temporary job there's bonus points if you destroy the lobby at your job because then you can land a permanent position it's like what is happening the lady she stole that job from is really really excited to be hired back though at the end how would she's you perfectly okay with it this? like why wouldn't you sue her she stole <laughs> your identity oh by the way Kayla's getting sued by everybody in real life. Yeah. And then she destroys a luxury hotel that has been standing for I don't know how many years that Michael Pena said, who is probably the best part of this movie. You liked Michael Pena in this? I I, I mean, maybe because I was just coming off of watching Ant-Man and I loved him. <laughs> I thought he was so fun in Ant Man. He was he wasn't bad. He was okay. No, he gets relegated to this just sort of like permanent scowl on his face because he's the only yeah. one who sees Kayla for who she is. Like when you talk about moments that made you laugh, I chuckled at the moment where he was <laughs> when she's like, "Oh, is is the fish the head of aquatic affairs or something?" And he's like. No, the fish is an animal. It doesn't have a position at the hotel. <laughs> but it could have a position at the hotel because this movie is weird because oh, yeah. some animals talk and some animals are just animals, but all animals are cartoons. But and again, there was a good joke because Tom is a musician in this. He can play the piano and it's like, you're mm -hmm. a cat that can play the piano. Why are you hustling for tips in Central Park? But and there was pretending you're blind. Like you, you're you don't blind. need the blind. <laughs> you no. don't need the blind gimmick, dude. Like you're, you're a cat, cat playing the piano. <laughs> but there was, but there was a bit because Jerry messes up his whole gimmick and he exposes him in front of a crowd full of people that he's not blind. And there's an, a bit of off-screen dialogue, and somebody's yelling, and they're appalled. And he goes, "He's just a regular cat playing the piano. He's not blind at all." And I was like, "That's funny." <laughs> See, there are oh, bits. God. There are some bits. 
Uh, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I enjoyed that. But back to my okay, but back to my point. Yeah, back sorry. Point. Could, yeah, go back. The the stakes of this movie and the the emotional weight of this movie I don't think works. And because there's so much of a dissonance between the human characters and the cartoons that whenever Chloe Grace Moretz was trying to interact with the cartoons, probably through no fault of her own, it's just, it's off. And I couldn't be fully invested. And I think the reason why something like Who Frames Roger Rabbit works so well, Who Frames Roger Rabbit works so well because it's a detective story at its core and a detective story. It's Chinatown. It's Chinatown. And the lead character does not need to change at all. Really, there is no classic quote unquote arc for the lead character in a, det- in a detective story. The world, you know, kind of stays the same. So you don't really need to be invested in that way. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why that works so well, in addition to the 2D animation that looks really, really good. This is not that. It was trying to ask mm-hmm. you to be invested in Kayla and invested in her relationship with the bartender who only shows up for a couple of scenes. And I just couldn't. I, I think it was also Chloe Grace Moretz. I'm not her biggest fan, but I know that she's a good actress. Like, we know she's a good actress. And it just felt like she was being sarcastic the whole time. Like a cool kid that thinks they're too cool to be in the school play, so they just half-ass it. It felt off, I think, because of that. I couldn't buy in because, one, her character was very unlikable. Two, Mm -hmm. she was half-assing her way through this entire thing just to get her paycheck. At least that was the impression that I got. Even Joy, the the bell girl. She was, see, she was enjoyable. She was so good, and she committed. And I honestly think I would have liked this a lot more if she was cast in the main role because... She was far more charming. You felt like she was like, there's no small role. You know, she took it seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think Michael Pena as well. He doubled down. And same thing with Ken Jeong. I mean, like no one half-assed the way that I think Chloe Grace Moretz did. And that's what made her even more unlikable. It felt like she wasn't even trying. Like she knew that she was in a stupid kids movie, which I wouldn't even call this a kids movie because it's so terrible. And so she was like, screw it. I'm, I'm phoning it in. Cut the check, Warner Brothers. Come on now. Direct deposit. Yeah. It's weird that all cartoons, all animals are cartoons. But when you eat a steak, yeah, it's a cartoon steak because you see that in Ken Jong's scene. It's One of his so scenes. uncomfortable. And this is a conspiracy that I have. This was funded by the radical vegan. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, let's personify animals as cartoons and see how they like it now. <laughs> but I mean, some animals in this universe talk. So what yeah. if you have a lobster that talks and then you're boiling it and you literally listen to it scream? I mean, it, there's so many questions. But the, they don't talk to humans. Because I guess the dogs that's technically talk. true. You never yeah. do see any of the animals I, talk to humans. Only I, I can't believe Tom, I'm making a logical. No, <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. You know what? You're right. I didn't think yeah. about it though. Tom only talks to some of those cats in the alley, but never talks to anybody else. But even Colin Joseph's dog talks, but mm-hmm. his owners don't understand what he's talking about. Whereas the cat, their other pet, does not speak. And I'm okay with that because that's how Tom and Jerry was. But it felt weird. I think that's what it was. Is they didn't go full force either way where it was completely cartoonish well then again i don't know does who framed roger rabbit really commit either way oh it does because there's whole clubs in who framed roger rabbit oh and his are, wife is his wife is his, murdered too mm-hmm. by the, yeah exactly like if you get hit by whatever cartoon thing it will actually kill you yes which which i appreciated that they were able to like create a world where there were rules oh it's a world that's totally integrated between yeah. cartoons and people and that's the yeah. whole conflict of the thing is like us cartoons we're we're lower class citizens than the real people it's like well maybe because you're 2d but who am i to say do you think that you can actually make a tom and jerry movie Like, there's a reason why these movies don't work. And I think it's because Tom and Jerry is predicated on slapstick comedy. And there's only so much you can do with that. Like, could you make an entire movie? I was thinking about this, too. And I I don't think so. Or if you're going to, you have to do what they did here, or at least try to, which was have the human characters be the ones that are the the emotional through line of the movie. Because Tom and Jerry work as six minute shorts or Mm -hmm. 20 minute shorts. And that's about how much Tom and Jerry you actually get in this movie. It's probably about 20 minutes of them actually doing slapstick comedy. I think it's too long for, especially for characters who don't talk. Yeah. If this was maybe 75 minutes, maybe it could have worked. As it exists right now, it, it could not. Or commit, right? Like in Tom and Jerry, all the adults, all the humans 
can only be seen from the waist down. I don't know if you yeah. remember that. So, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. When they do bring in heart in human characters, it's very short amounts of time and you never actually see faces. Like, I think that would have been interesting. And I, I was reading a, a review about it and he was saying it would have been better if he was already living at the hotel. Maybe he was the owner's cat or something and he was living a cushy life and then Jerry moves in and- Oh, he's trying to of- box him out of his spot. Exactly. Essentially, he kind of like gets him in trouble and gets him kicked out. And I was like, oh, that's actually a compelling idea that you could actually build a feature length film out of. It doesn't have to be as long as it was. But the whole lobby situation, when I looked at the You're real time, stuck on this lobby thing. You're oh, real big on the lobby. <laughs> no, because I, I, I was thinking the repercussions of that moment are terrible. And on top of that, it's like they still have the wedding afterwards and the lobby's completely fine. It's just, <laughs> yeah, they clean that up real quick. Yeah, I'm like, there's no way. Because <laughs> there's a lot of destruction in this movie. Because they kind of like have I, a I precursor. Yeah, they have a yeah. precursor to the destruction. What? Because it starts in the bar and then goes out to the lobby. Exactly. And then they have the wedding and then there's even more destruction. And that's when they've got like tigers and peacocks and all that. And that's when I was thinking like, you're caring so much about a mouse there were, you just walked by a Bengal tiger. Why do you yeah. care about this mouse? Why are you so concerned about this mouse? It baffled me. It really did. Uh, and the most unrealistic part was when the guest took responsibility for losing their own ring and didn't blame a housekeeper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> when, I, when I saw that, I was like, she lost likely a multi-million dollar wedding ring and she didn't blame even one housekeeper. Like, come on. I can't even count how many times a guest has lost their own shit and they always blame the housekeeper only to find that they never even brought it on their trip. And really, Jerry, why is Jerry being a dick about things? Because he steals that ring and he's just like, oh, no, I got the ring. But he brings it back to her and he tries to use it as leverage. Which, exactly. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah, no, he tries every- to muscle her out of, she's like, I got the <laughs> ring. I'm holding it ransom. <laughs> Everyone is terrible in this. I'm telling yes. you. I do love that Ken Jung when he's like, there's a Michelin star representative or whatever coming to the wedding. If they find out that there's a mouse, my career, my son's career, and he points at like, <laughs> like the, the whitest dude ever. The whitest dude ever. Like that, like I wonder if Ken Jung improv that. Yeah, I wonder if he improv that because that is a really funny moment. I you know, I didn't mind those parts. And I think that this could have been funnier. Because there was, you know, like the whole droopy as the Joker on the billboard when he's yeah. coming out of the subway, put on a happy face. Like, oh, okay, good, good job, Warner Brothers. You marketed another one of your IPs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's what this. See, that's what this is all about. This is all about Warner Brothers trying about to the hook Joker. the kids, yeah. hook the kids in young. Yeah, exactly. I did read that this is not the worst Tom and Jerry feature length film, though. I, yeah, I read that too. Because the 1992 version, which I will be honest, I only saw clips of, and it was very disconcerting, is apparently worse because they give Tom and Jerry voices for the first time. Mm-hmm. And Jerry sounds like you would expect, like a tiny little mouse, high vo- high pitched, squeaky. And Tom sounds like he's in Goodfellas. <laughs> and it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> he has a New York accent, and he's like, hey. And that begs the question that I asked is, you know, I, I know about that one and how bad it was. Is like, can you actually make a feature length film? And why do we keep trying? Because people know the characters and because any sort of IP, according to Warner Brothers, is just going to be shilled out there. Overall, Tom and Jerry, don't waste your time. Even if you have children. Don't waste your kids time. <laughs> I mean, hey, look, if it, if it keeps their attention for 90 minutes. You know, who am I to say? Do not degrade your child's intelligence by letting them watch this. <laughs> Overall, Tom and Jerry, skip it. That's the skip consensus it. from this week's no. episode. But that does it for this week's episode. If you watch Tom and Jerry, let us know what you thought. Did you agree or disagree with anything we discussed? We are shifting the structure of the podcast to allow for more fun themes and discussions, and we'll also be releasing full episodes bi-weekly or every other week. If you have any ideas for a theme you'd like us to discuss, or a film, TV show, anything pop culture, let us know on YouTube, Instagram, or Twitter. You can find all those links on channel 8 That's channel 8 and a half, completely spelled out, dot com. Until next time, my name is Joe Galino. And I'm Andrew Hanna, and this is channel 8 and a half.